So you've all heard today how to treat wet AMD. And that's all well and good so long as you know for sure that it is wet AMD because the results that have been quoted um, and that approximately 50% fluid resolution in the CAT trial is for patients who actually have wet AMD. Those patients have been um, seen by retina specialists and vetted by, um, uh, vetted by reading centers, so you know for sure they do. But um, many times, you know, we get referred patients in who've been treated with anti-VEGF therapy who don't respond to treatment. And the question um, that I'd like you to think about is, are these patients truly non-responders, or is it just time to revisit the diagnosis? AMD can actually be very tricky to diagnose. And I would highly recommend that you are sure of the diagnosis before subjecting the patient to what could be a lifetime of intravitreal injections. So just to recap on the differential diagnosis of AMD, there's high myopia, ocular histoplasmosis, and adult onset foveomacular dystrophy. Basal lamina drusen, central serous chorioretinopathy, and juxtafoveal telangiectasias. Now, I've put these on the first slide because these are the most common things that you um, have to think about. There are other things such as Sorsby's fundus dystrophy, pattern dystrophies, angioid streaks, uh, cone rod dystrophy, rubella retinopathy, and Stargardt's disease. Less common, but you should also think about them. Also on the list is uh, uveitic entities such as punctate inner choroidopathy, serpiginous choroidopathy, and uh, a very rare disease called North Carolina macular dystrophy. Uh, choroidal osteomas have also been mistaken uh, for AMD, uh, as well as Best disease and dominant drusen. So with this in mind, I'm going to uh, go through a few cases that I've seen here at Mayo. And uh, the first patient is a 56-year-old white female who complains of slightly blurry vision, 2030 in the right and 2040 in the left. And what you notice on the color photograph is what looks like drusen, some subretinal fluid, and pigment changes, and a slightly yellowish appearance here in the center. Similar findings on the left eye, but a more circumscribed yellow lesion. So autofluorescence shows a few abnormalities, but nothing really distinctive just yet. This is the infrared. Again, autofluorescence here shows an increase in autofluorescence, which we can see with some types of vitelliform yellowish material. So the fluorescein angiogram here is pretty diagnostic because all of a sudden all these drusen emerge, the starry sky pattern that wasn't seen before on um, color photography. The fluorescein angiogram shows some hyperfluorescence, but it's difficult to tell at this point if this is leakage or just filling of this vitelliform lesion. And same thing in the left eye. Now this is very frequently uh, mistaken for leakage from choroidal neovascularization. What the OCT shows is uh, some material, the vitelliform uh, material underneath the retina as opposed to a clear uh, PED. And you see the same thing in the left eye. This is basal lamina drusen uh, with a vitelliform lesion. And these do not respond to anti-VEGF therapy. Now, the natural history of these, given no treatment and given a long enough follow-up, is for this lesion here to um, break down and cause geographic atrophy. So actually, if you treat the patient with anti-VEGF therapy for long enough, you may think that you dried up the patient and caused the vision to get worse, whereas this is, in fact, a breakdown of the vitelliform lesion. The next patient's a 33-year-old white male followed for an old idiopathic CNV, 2060 in the right eye, 2040 for uh, eight years, and now referred for a pigment epithelial detachment. You see some fluid and some yellowish material in, uh, in the macula, and again, a lot more yellowish material in the left eye. Autofluorescence here is pretty characteristic because you see the increase in autofluorescence and especially in the left eye. This is a fluorescein angiogram, but I would say that the autofluorescence in this case is uh, most characteristic. 
The OCT does show some subretinal fluid, and here the vitelliform yellow-like, <coughs> yolk-like material, and the same thing on the left eye, you can see the yolk-like material. So this is in fact Best's disease in a 33-year-old white male, and genetic testing was consistent with Best's disease, as was the uh, EOG. So the next lady is a 61-year-old white female complaining of vision distortion in the left eye, again referred for an RPE detachment in the left eye. This time she has 20-20 vision in the right eye and 20-40 in the left eye. It doesn't look like much here on the color photo, but here you start to appreciate in the left eye that she has what appears uh, to be swelling in the macula. If you look around the nerve, you'll also see what appears to be faint areas of blood and the same thing around the nerve in the left eye. So if you look at the OCT, again, you might think that this is wet AMD because of the PED here. And this is what the fluorescein angiogram shows. This is the early phase. You can actually see around here, there's some hyperfluorescence. And you see it a little bit better, some leakage around the nerve. And again, uh, this is the left eye, the eye she can complained about, and you see this leakage which looks like a polypoid uh, leakage, and it leaks into the pigment epithelial detachment. ICG is an excellent diagnostic tool for these cases, and you can see uh, the extent of the polyps. So this is polypoidal choroidal vasculopathy, which is very commonly mistaken for wet AMD. It's <coughs> often thought to occur more in Asians, but you'd be surprised how many times we see it in the Caucasian population. So initially, I treated her with intravitreal bevacizumab and saw her a month later, but she got worse. She got to 2070, and the PED was actually higher. So then I decided to do focal laser to the polypoidal vessels that were supranasal to the fovea, in other words, the feeders, and I saw her back in a month. A month later, she had a PED. It was a little flatter, still 2040. However, I didn't retreat her because the fluorescein angiogram showed no leakage. This leaky lesion that was feeding into the PED had now closed off. Three months later, she was completely flat. <coughs> Next patient was referred in with wet AMD after receiving five monthly anti-VEGF injections of bevacizumab and ranibizumab. She was 2200 in the right eye and 2025 in the left eye. What you see here, it looks like a very large area of either subretinal fluid or a pigment epithelial detachment where the blood has settled, almost like a hypopian, and there's suspicion that the leak is coming from this area. Uh, this is the left eye. Um, there may be what looks like drusen. Again, we have a PED with subretinal fluid uh, in the right eye. The left eye is normal. And here you see the feeder that's feeding into the PED. So despite five anti-VEGF injections, there was no improvement. And again, you see something around the nerve. So um, I performed a focal laser to the choroidal neovascular membrane um, in the right eye, right here. Eight weeks later, she still looked the same. However, fluorescein angiography was very useful in that it told us that the CNV was closed. Three months later, she was 2030. Again, the CNV was closed, but this time she was completely flat. So instead of subjecting the patient to a lifetime of anti-VEGF therapy that wasn't going to work, it was important to find the right diagnosis and uh, initiate the right treatment. The next patient's a 52-year-old white female complaining of blurry vision. She's 2050 in the right eye and 2030 in the left eye, referred for swelling in the retina, possible wet AMD. Nothing unusual here on the color photo, nor on the left eye, but you start to see leakage here temporal to the fovea from what appears like a network of uh, capillaries. And this leaks intensely, and you can see how this might be mistaken for a classic choroidal neovascular membrane. We have a similar pattern on the left eye. What we see on the OCT is an outer retinal defect and uh, what looks like cysts, and again, could go along with the picture of cystoid macular edema, but these are in fact lamella holes with um, uh, sort of straight lines between them as opposed to rounded uh, cysts. 
And again, look at the elongation here of this on the left eye. So this is actually uh, MACTEL, or juxtafovial telangiectasia type 2. It is actually associated with lamella holes. It can leak on fluorescein angiography. Right now, there are a number of clinical trials going on to find out the best way to treat these patients. Um, but anti-VEGF therapy may help a little bit, but the OCT will not change. And um, occasionally, the fluorescein uh, can get better. But they actually do very well without treatment.